It's been said that the current hybrid power engines, and in fact all electric or hybrid engines, are more torquey than previous engines that did not have an electric motor as part of their power delivery. In this video we'll look at what torque actually is, and then see how torque is delivered to the rear wheels, and crucially, what it means to say an engine is more torquey, or that it delivers torque instantly. Right, let's start with what's torque. Torque is a turning force, so we use it for the most part when referring to forcing something to rotate. So it could be the force of turning a wheel around an axle, pulling open a door on a hinge, or undoing a nut from a screw. In fact, let's imagine this nut for a second to better understand torque. Let's imagine the nut is on pretty tightly and we're trying to undo it with a spanner. Let's use a really long spanner for reasons we'll see in a second. Now the amount of torque applied is measured by taking the distance from the pivot point at which you're applying the force and multiplying it by how much force you're putting in. So let's think about this in action. I could push down 15 centimeters from the pivot point on this spanner with 150 newtons of force, and a newton is just a measure of force. Now outside of America, we tend to use newton meters as units of torque. So we just multiply distance by force here and see we're putting in 22 and a half newton meters of torque into the nut, trying to get it to turn. Now the nut is really tight and won't come off under this torque. So we decide to double the torque. Now we could do that by pushing down twice as hard, but let's say that 150 newtons is the hardest we can push. Instead, we can just double the distance because that will double the torque. So we push with 150 newtons of force, 30 centimeters from the pivot, and that generates 45 newton meters of torque, causing the nut to come loose. So anyway, we double the distance, double the torque. We didn't have to put more energy in to get more turning force out, which is impressive and interesting, right? And this is also how jacks work in pit stop. One person can lift the entire back end of an F1 car because they push the jack really far from the pivot, which generates a lot of torque in the system. The lifting pad of the jack is really close to the pivot, so the force pushing the car up is magnified, as for constant torque, shrinking the distance multiplies the force you put in. So let's apply this to an engine. An engine has a piston, which is forced down by a little explosion in the cylinder, so it's applying a force downwards, which is carried through the rod, and this turns a crankshaft, which is just a cylindrical axle beneath the engine. We see the piston applies a force to the crankshaft, causing it to spin, so it and the other five pistons are collectively generating some torque to spin the crankshaft at incredible speeds. If we stick a gear cog on the end of the crankshaft, we can measure the force the gear pushes with at its circumference to work out how much torque the engine is delivering to the crankshaft at any given time. Now, this torque, the turning force measured at the crankshaft, is the engine torque we talk about when, when describing, well, the torque of the engine. But this is not the torque delivered to the wheels that make them spin. To get there, we need to go on a little journey, and I'm going to describe it in broad terms to illustrate it using models and not the exact systems you'll find in an F1 car. So the crankshaft connects to the transmission, which drives a drive shaft, which connects to an axle gear, which drives the wheels. The transmission has gears of different sizes that will connect to the crankshaft depending on which gear the driver selects. The different gears are described by their ratios, which just describes how big the gear is compared to the gear it connects with the crankshaft. First gear has the biggest ratio, so it might be 10 times the size of the crankshaft gear. These ratios get smaller and smaller until 8th gear, which might have a ratio of 0.75 to 1 with the crankshaft gear. Now why are gear ratios important? Well, because the ratio of the size of the two gears directly influences the change in torque between the crankshaft and the drive shaft. Now already you should have the information you need to figure out why, but let's step through it. Let's keep it super simple and say we're in first gear and that first gear has a gear ratio of 10, so it's 10 times bigger than the gear at the crankshaft. Now, when the gears connect, there is a driving gear, and that's the one with the power going through it, and a driven gear, and that's the gear that gains power from the driving gear when they connect. So in this case, the driving gear is the one at the crankshaft, and it's driving the first gear here. The driving gear carries the torque of the crankshaft. So if the engine is producing 200 newton meters of torque, the driving gear at the crankshaft has 200 newton meters of torque. The two gears connecting means the teeth of the driving gear are pushing with a force on the teeth of the first gear. So the force where the two gears meet is the same, obviously, because they're connected by a one force. But because our first gear is 10 times bigger in diameter, the torque delivered to it is 10 times bigger than the torque at the crankshaft, because as we saw, if you apply a force further from the pivot, it multiplies the torque you generate. And this torque goes straight to the drive shaft, so we could say the drive shaft has 10 times as much torque as the engine is pulling at the crankshaft. Now the gear that converts this turning force to the axle remains constant and is probably around 3 to 1, so we then multiply the torque by 3 to give a final torque at the wheels of 6,000 newton meters. And that's a good 30 times greater than the torque the engine delivers to the crankshaft. And this is what a gearbox does. It takes the torque of the engine and it multiplies it up to different amounts depending on how much torque the wheels need. Now to accelerate from standstill, the wheels need a lot of torque to get it going. It's just a lot harder to get a system moving. That's why the ratio of the first gear is the biggest, as it has the biggest multiplying effect. 
Once everything's moving though, you need less and less torque to accelerate and maintain the wheel rotation speed. Now you'll also notice while you're driving rotation to the larger gear that the gear rotates more slowly. If the gear ratio is 10 to 1, as it is with our pretend first gear, you'll need to rotate the driving gear 10 times to get the driven gear to turn once. So you're getting a lot of torque out of this gearing, but not actually getting it to rotate very fast. With smaller gears, you're putting as much power in, but you need to rotate the wheels much faster to achieve those high speeds. And you can use these small gears at high speeds because you don't need to put lots of torque in to keep the rotational momentum up. So ignoring normal energy losses for the moment, just note that the power of the system doesn't change between the engine and the wheels. Power is just the rate at which the engine delivers energy to the wheels. If the engine is putting out 500 horsepower at the crankshaft, it's delivering 500 horsepower at the wheels. Again, we're ignoring any losses due to friction. Now this power will go up and down depending on the speed of the engine, that is its RPM, but not with how you gear up the car. All that changes is the torque and the rotational speeds. If you up the torque, you sacrifice turning speeds at the wheels. So what's interesting is that whatever the power of the engine, you can deliver as much or as little torque as you like to the wheels if you play around with the gear ratios enough. It won't give you any more power though. So what are we talking about when we say, oh lord, these electric engines have a lot of torque? Well firstly we don't mean they have a lot of torque, that's a bit of a misunderstanding, but we can talk about torque delivery, or in a colloquial way, a car being kind of torquey. Now we have to look at torque curves, and this means graphs, and I know that's not intuitive to everyone, but I'm going to make it super simple. So let's draw some axes. Now along the horizontal axis here we're going to represent RPM, which is revs per minute. And as we move along the axis, the engine does this. Now up this axis, we're going to measure torque, so the higher up the chart we go, the more turning force the engine is delivering to the crankshaft. Not the wheels, the crankshaft. So we're talking about pure torque delivery before we've even got the gears to play with it. We're going to look at a petrol engine part on its own here, just the combustion engine, not the electric motor. Now with this engine, we don't get maximum torque straight away. At low revs, as the engine is building up speed, it's taking its time to reach maximum torque. There's a few reasons for this. Partly, as there are a lot of moving parts right through the drivetrain, the engine has to put a lot of its energy into overcoming the friction between these parts. And partly, as the combustion parts of the engine work on sucking fuel and air into the cylinder, it takes a certain amount of engine speed to bring the optimal amounts of air and fuel into play. So the torque curve ends up looking like this, with the torque getting higher and higher and higher as the engine gets faster and faster. And it peaks around 12,000 RPM and then starts to drop. Now it drops because the mechanical resistance of the engine starts to dominate, and the cylinder can't pull in any more air and fuel fast enough to create more power. This is the peak torque of the engine, at this sort of area, around 10 to 12,000 RPM. Now you can confirm this because you'll notice after the initial acceleration phase the gears are specifically set up such that changing through the gears keeps the rev in this peak torque range right through to maximum speeds. Keep your eye on the telemetry graphics like this one. So looking at this curve, we can see the torque has a sort of lag, not reaching its maximum until the engine is basically at its fastest speed. From here, in the car, the driver will feel an initial pull of acceleration and this will grow and grow up to this point. Not very torquey, slow to reach its full torque. Now an electric motor has a very different torque curve. Unlike the combustion engine, it has very few mechanical parts and it doesn't rely on the flow of fuel and air. In fact, we know from our previous video on the MG UK that it's just a rotor spinning in a magnetic field. Very simple. So there's next to no resistance on this motor, so the instant you put your foot down, you'll pretty much jump straight to maximum torque. And the torque curve looks like this, showing that max torque is delivered from the very beginning. And that's why electric cars and hybrids feel very torquey, because they're delivering all this torque right up front, which puts a lot of the engine's potential power straight into the wheels. In hybrid systems like the ones in F1 cars, the electric motor fills in some of the torque lag at low engine speeds, giving more instant high torque to the wheels that was missing before. Now you'll see after a point the torque drops off quite dramatically with an electric motor, and the thing with electric motors is that when putting a rotational spin into the electric motor, we also generate some electromotive force in resistance to the direction of the current. And after a certain RPM, it dominates and overpowers the current in the motor, forcing a drop off in torque delivery. Now, just to reiterate, an engine feeling very torquey doesn't mean it's more powerful. A Formula E car feels more torquey than an F1 car, for example. But the power delivered by the engine to the wheels ramps up faster the more torque is being delivered. Now, we can show with a bit of mathematical manipulation that power is just torque times revs per minute. So if there was a constant torque, then the power would just ramp up directly with RPM. 
If there's more torque, the power ramps up more quickly. If there's less torque, the power ramps up more slowly. So a high torque engine isn't more powerful, but it does help deliver the power to the engine more quickly. So hopefully that's given you a better idea of what torque is. Engine torque is simply the turning force of the engine that's then translated down the drivetrain, manipulated by the gearbox to multiply it up and provide drive torque to the rear wheels. You need maximum torque at low speeds to get the car accelerating and lower torque at high speeds to keep the wheels spinning faster, which is why high gears are smaller and do not crank the torque up as much as low gears. And torque does not affect the amount of power in the system, which is just the rate at which the engine delivers energy.